Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Beneficial Ownership and Due Diligence, Stepping Up Your Institution's Information Collection Practices. We are so excited to have you join us today. Before we jump into the content, let's roll through some quick housekeeping items. We will send out a link to the slides, resources, certificate of attendance, and webinar recording in a follow-up email, so be sure to keep an eye on your inbox. In the meantime, you can find the presentation slides and other relevant resources in the handout section of GoToWebinar now. Additionally, we will have a few poll questions we'd love for you all to answer throughout the webinar. We utilize your responses to help tailor our content, so your involvement is greatly appreciated. If you have any questions you'd like to ask throughout the presentation, please use the questions section in the GoToWebinar panel to address the speaker. If we don't have enough time to answer your question during the session, we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. In January 2019, Bankers Toolbox, an anti-money laundering and fraud detection software provider, SageWorks, a lending and portfolio risk platform, MST, an allowance provider, and Farin, a financial information company, all came together to become Abrigo. Abrigo's platform centralizes the institution's data creates a digital user experience, ensures compliance, and delivers efficiency for scale and profitable growth. Our annual Think Big Conference is now open for 2022 registration. Consistently rated a top industry event by attendees, the conference brings together industry thought leaders, experts, and financial institution peers for three days of compelling educational content and networking. Don't miss out on early bird registration. Now through January 31st, saves $250. Register now with the link in the chat. Customer due diligence is the cornerstone of a strong BSA AML compliance program, and regulatory expectation is that you know your customer with relative certainty. Download our helpful checklist outlining key elements to a strong CDD program using the link in the chat. Don't miss our upcoming webinar. In this session, expert Terry Luttrell will discuss the current legislative and regulatory climate and give tips on knowing what your financial institution should do now to prepare. Register now for our webinar at the end of this month. Hope to see you there. Today's presenter is Kevin Gulledge, Senior Risk Management Consultant at Abrigo. We are very excited to have him joining us today. And with that, I will go ahead and pass the reins over to Kevin. Take it away. Thank you, Kirsten. Hi, everybody. This is what I look like now, <laughs> post-COVID, pre-COVID. So I'm going to turn this off so we can uh, focus on the presentation today. But thank you all for joining me. I uh, hope we have some fun with this presentation today. I'm going to stop that webcam. OK, so let's go ahead and dive into this. Uh, you know, I want to apologize for what happened last time, we tried to have this presentation in mid-December and my power went out right in the middle of the presentation. Uh, Colorado Springs actually had some, some bad windstorms come through and some folks lost power for, for more than a week. So our power came on the same day, <clears throat> probably around five or six. So I'm feel very fortunate, but I feel like I let y'all down. I wanted to be here to have this presentation. Uh, I wanted to send y'all off into 2022, but hey, here we are, we're in 2022 now. So maybe we can get this thing started on the right foot. Uh, here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the P papers, and, and I'm not talking about the pads that you use for potty training your dog. We're going to talk about what the P papers mean. We're going to talk about CDD, EDD. Uh, we're going to talk about beneficial ownership. We're going to talk about the new uh, AML Act, uh, Corporate Transparency Act. We're going to talk about that, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A uh, at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and start with this. And, you know, just a couple of uh, notes here before we get started. Um, you know, if you're worried, Colorado has a lot of wildfires right now up near Boulder. Uh, that's about a couple of hours away from me. So very, feeling very fortunate that, you know, we're not that close to that. We had some snow over New Year's Eve. So hopefully that keeps the ground a little, a little wet for a little while. Um, but, you know, again, I want to apologize for losing the power last time. Hopefully, you know, for those of you who weren't on the last call, forget all of that. I didn't say any of that. I, everything was fine the last time. Uh, but thank you for joining me today. And so let's go ahead and dive in. So whenever we start talking about the P papers, I'm talking about the Pandora papers, the Panama papers, the Paradise papers. Some of these you may have heard of, uh, maybe you heard of one or two, maybe you didn't hear of a few of these. I'm hoping that you can take some things away from, from, from the presentation today. You know, if I had Grover and 
uh, you know, Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch here with me, they tell you that today's presentation is brought to you by the letter P. So we're going to start with uh, the Panama Papers. All right, so with the Panama Papers, all of these that I'm going to talk about, these were um, leaks of documents from either law firms, offshore, offshore law, law firms, business services type things, corporate service providers. So we're going to see some of that today. Panama Papers actually came from one law firm in particular, Mossack Fonseca. Uh, two guys, Jurgen Mossack and Ramon Fonseca, uh, they had pretty much gone under the radar for, for a pretty long time. And it wasn't until this whistleblower released these documents back in 2016, which 2016 feels like it was 400 years ago. I don't even know. Uh, but these, these documents were created by and then taken from the law firm. The whistleblower is still anonymous, which is how it should be with any strong whistleblower protections. Uh, but Masak Monseca was working with over 300,000 entities. So this was not an unknown you know, law firm. This is just a law firm that kind of went under the radar being based in Panama. So what happened was this whistleblower released these documents, which sort of pointed towards sort of, I want to say illegal, let's say unsavory, maybe immoral, and maybe there was some illegality in there, uh, but was setting up shell corporations for uh, businesses in the United States and abroad. They were using these shell corporations to avoid international sanctions, to avoid taxes. Uh, so these are, this is pretty egregious. Now, you know, banks were involved with this. It wasn't just, you know, the, the, the apples of the world or the, you know, the Facebooks of the world. This was also uh, involving banks. You know, they were setting up over 15,000 shell corporations, 500 banks did, which uh, whenever we get right down to it, you know, HSBC has been in the news, <laughs> in and out of the news for the last 10, 15 years or so. They actually uh, created more than 2,300 of those 15,000 uh, shell corporations. Now, why does the, why does somebody need 2,300 shell corporations? You know, I'm probably not the right person to ask that question of because I can't answer it. Um, so we saw a lot of this within the Panama Papers. Uh, October 2020, Germany issued arrest warrants uh, for Mossack and Fonseca. Uh, they were arrested on criminal organization tax evasion charges. Um, you know, we'll see. I think sometimes the ball of justice rolls a little slowly with some of these. Uh, but this is showing that, you know, these businesses could go to an offshore provider and have them do this for them and really sort of take away the um, purpose or the, you know, we had to do this. We had to set it up. No, we let Mossack Fonseca set it up. Now, you know, being in the AML industry, the fraud industries, compliance industries, you know, we get a lot of questions from, I know I do, family and friends that say, well, what exactly is it that you do? And I know it's hard to explain sometimes that we're trying to catch criminals, we're trying to catch tax evasion, tax fraud, we're trying to catch money laundering. Uh, so what I would recommend to friends and family is if they have Netflix, check out The Laundromat. It's a fun movie that explains what uh, what Masak Fonseca was doing and it gives fun explanations for it. Uh, Meryl Streep's in the movie, you know, so she's great. So, um, But I just, I, I like the movie, I enjoyed it, I thought it was fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously. So if you have friends that are like, what the heck are you doing? Say, we're busting people like we see in The Laundromat. So now I wanna show you some of the people that were mentioned within these documents. Now, just because they're mentioned doesn't mean they were doing anything illegal, because remember, you know, in the, at least in the US at this time, shell corporations are perfectly legal. So I wanted to show you how it ran the gamut from somebody that was uh, ahead of a, of a country, all the way down to, you know, somebody who's a local celebrity, a musician, uh, actor, those sorts of things. And, you know, I stand by the Simon Cowell description of reality TV bully, that is what he is. <laughs> the other ones I have a little fun with. Uh, but King of Saudi Arabia, the former president of Argentina, these are people that, you know, are the most powerful people in their country. And they're involved with shell corporations, either buying things through shell corporations, setting up trust through shell corporations. There's a lot of things that, that they were involved in. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, Hermione down there, Emma Watson was doing something illegal on the level of the King of Saudi Arabia. Everybody was doing something a little different. But that's why it's so critical that, you know, these documents get leaked and then get investigated. You know, all of these leaks went to the same uh, 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 association. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but this wasn't, so this wasn't Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. This wasn't Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, those sorts of people. Uh, these were documents that were leaked by whistleblowers. So again, having those strong whistleblower protections, many of them are still anonymous. So that was the Panama Papers. That was the first big leak that we saw way back in, I think April of 2016, which <laughs> Feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, but now let's transition to the Paradise Papers. So this was the biggest leak in terms of documents, uh, 13 and a, almost 13 and a half million documents uh, published in 2017, which again, still feels like a lifetime ago. 
these documents were not taken just from one entity. These documents were taken from several entities. So there was a law, an offshore law firm, Appleby, a corporate services provider, Estera, an Asia City Trust, and then business registries from 19 countries. And this really exposed the way that these multinational corporations are using these foreign countries with lax tax laws for tax engineering purposes. Uh, it showed tax-free shopping sprees that some African and Asian co uh, companies were doing in Mauritius and Singapore. So this is showing that you know, even though they have these tax laws in their country, they can still go somewhere else and they can they can buy things, they can register things, they can do things in other countries that don't have those strong uh, tax laws. Now, this one was really sort of focused on those big, large multinational corporations. And, you know, before uh, investigating for this or researching for this presentation, I had never heard of Glencore. Uh, they're the world's largest commodity trader. So they're constantly going into countries to, to sign uh, you know, contracts so that they can have access to mineral resources. And it showed, these documents showed that they used a lot of heavy handed tactics, a lot of backroom deals and things like that, especially with, uh, in regards to the Democratic People's Republic of the Congo. Uh, they were trying to get valuable res mineral resources there. You know, these are things used to make uh, the computer chips, uh, the processing chips, things like that for your phone, for your computer. Uh, and they really use these back backdoor heavy handed tactics to to be able to access that and show that these companies can really go in and move in and sort of have their way with, with this once they sign those contracts. Um, you know, down at the bottom, you know, the, the owners of the yachts and the private jets, they're registering those in the Isle of Man. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I register my yacht in the United States. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't have a yacht. Uh, Jeff Bezos, he has a yacht so big he can park a yacht inside of it. Like, what's that about? Like, so they're probably all registering these overseas because they just don't have to pay the same taxes. They don't have to same, pay the same fees. So this is, again, going to another country with lax tax laws, doing something that you can't get away with in the United States. So as I mentioned, this had a bigger focus on those bigger multinational companies. And these are some of the companies in the league. <laughs> not a Brio, not the one down at the bottom. I had to make that clear. Uh, Apple, Facebook, McDonald's. Uh, these are the biggest companies you know, in the United States. Apple's valuation on the stock market is over three trillion dollars um, some of them that you might not know uh, Siemens is a semiconductor uh, they make um, you know computer chips and things like that allergen or allergen I'm not sure how to pronounce that one at the bottom they make Botox so by themselves with just Hollywood and, and Beverly Hills they probably make millions of billions off of that so these are the companies that were referenced within these documents I can tell you that Apple used to be or I think they still might be registered in Ireland. And once Ireland said, hey, we want to start taxing you, uh, Apple has now tried to move. And so they're going to move that registration uh, to another country that probably has even lesser or more lax tax laws than even Ireland did. So again, bigger focus on multinational companies, but there were still the people mentioned. And, and again, I want to show you the how wide this runs. And it runs from, you know, Martha Stewart, and, you know, she a good old convicted felon all the way up to Queen Elizabeth II. And we have people that were former secretaries within, you know, the federal government for Obama and Trump administrations. We have the celebrities in here as well. And again, coming out and saying, what are you doing within this, within this leak? Where are you moving this money? What are you involved in? I know Bono was involved in he had an investment in another company in another country, and they were doing something uh, illegal or unusual. And so Bono pulled out his investment. So it's not to say that these folks are doing something illegal. They might have not even known that this was happening, but because they're invested, because they put money into it, that's why they're being referenced within these documents. So, you know, just wanted to show how, how wide that, that went and, you know, all the way up to Queen Elizabeth II, probably the most powerful woman in the world. Uh, 12 main documents for Pandora. So Pandora, we have Panama, Paradise, Pandora. That's why we did the P papers. This was almost 12 main documents published uh, just in October of last year. So this one's still kind of rolling out. Now, all of these leaks were sent to the ICIJ. That's the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They receive all three of these leaks. Uh, you know, they've been able to estimate how much money is being, you know, overseas in, in a country where, you know, the country was, the, the money was made in a country and then, you know, sent somewhere else for, for tax purposes. So they estimate that at anywhere from five to $32 trillion. A uh, crazy amount of money there. Uh, the OECD estimates that at around $11 trillion. Now, once you start to see how much money was actually repatriated, you'll see that the, the numbers here are just astronomical. It's hard to wrap your head around 14 trillion, 10 trillion, 20 trillion, 1 trillion it would be hard for me to wrap my head around, but that's how much money it is. And this isn't just the United States. This is any country where the money was made 
and then move to another country. So it's a large, large number. Uh, it's a large amount of money. I've never, I could never wrap my head around that much money. It's probably enough money to stretch to the moon and back. Uh, now, however, for Pandora Papers, very much like Paradise Papers, leaked from several different entities. This time from 14 different offshore uh, serv corporate service providers, also known, you know, business service providers, uh, law firms. Most of them were law firms. So just like Mossack Fonseca, just like uh, Appleby, these law firms were helping these companies and people set up shell corporations so that they can purchase things or, or hide their purchases. So here's some some bigger ones that I pulled from. Uh, you know, I encourage you that if you're interested, go, you know, Google ICIJ, their website, they, they have so much more information out there. There's no way I could have put all that information into the, today's presentation. But I wanted to give you some highlights of, of the Pandora Papers. So there's a, uh, the Prime Minister of, Czech, of the Czech Republic has been in public railing against corruption, you know, money laundering, fraud, you know, using these shell corporations. And then what does he do? He turns around and uses a shell, uses a shell corporation to buy a chateau in the French Riviera. Now, I don't know about y'all. You know, I'm going to go tell my lawyer to go, you know, buy me a chateau in the French Riviera, just use my pocket change, I guess, but $22 million. So if we didn't know that, if we didn't have any of this information from these leaks, we wouldn't know that the prime minister of the Czech Republic was the one who bought that chateau. Um, another example, uh, Guatemala. There's a family in Guatemala. They have a large international business, I believe it's cosmetics, uh, but they've been accused of human rights abuses, criminal wrongdoing, you know, pollution of the earth. Uh, and they have a trust in the United States for their son, $13 million. And again, if we didn't have this information, all we would know is that there's a $13 million trust in the United States. We wouldn't know who actually set that trust up. And trusts are super tricky. And we'll talk about some trusts later on when we talk about beneficial ownership and, and customer due diligence, but it's tricky. And, and that's the, the benefit of these leaks is that we can see that $13 million trust, oh, that's owned by somebody who probably shouldn't have that money there, okay? Uh, do you remember the Arab Spring? Uh, that was back, oh my gosh, when did that happen? 2014, I think, it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, 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 you know, there were a lot of protests, a lot of uprising, you know, from Egypt and on. Some some leaders stepped down, some leaders didn't. Uh, but all while this was happening, all while the, the, the you know, the, the middle class and the poor were protesting, the, the, the King of Jordan went right out to Malibu and bought three beachfront mansions. Now I can't even imagine how much money that cost but it was purchased through a shell corporation. So again, if we didn't know, if we didn't have this leak, we would know that the King of Jordan owned those three B Trump mansions. They would just be owned by, you know, a generic corporate, ABC corporate LLC, something like that. So this is why, you know, and, and I'm really drilling this home because this is why getting the beneficial ownership information is so critical. And we'll talk about some examples. We'll walk through some examples in just a little bit. Now, again, I want to show you who's involved in, in this leak. And this one had a lot more presidents from, from various countries in it. The King of Jordan, the Emir of Qatar. And then you can see some even Olympic uh, athletes, Elvis Stoiko, all the way down to, which I know we only know Ringo Starr from being in The Simpsons, right? We don't know him from anything else. <laughs> so anyway, so these are showing you that, again, some of the most powerful people in the world are involved with this. And when the most powerful people in the world are involved with this, are we going to see a lot of investigations on this? Yes and no. We did see some investigations. As I said, Germany issued arrest warrants for Mossack Fonseca, but uh, you know, some Chinese officials were, were, were mentioned in these leaks with, with the Panama Papers. So they don't even allow you to look that up in the Chinese internet. You know, China controls their internet a lot more uh, than the United States. The United States is a little, little bit of a wild west. But if you go to China, you use their internet, you're not going to find it on social media. You're not going to find it on you know, the search engines. It's completely blocked in China. Uh, now, Panama got <laughs> pretty mad that we were calling in the Panama Papers. I don't say we, like I'm the one who picked the name, but that we all use the term Panama Papers. They really said, hey, why are you calling them that? It's Mossack Fonseca. We didn't approve of what they're doing. You know, so please, can you call it the Mossack Fonseca Papers? And it didn't stick. Panama Papers stuck. And you can see they continue that tradition of using the P Papers from Panama and on. But Panama was just coming out of the fat of gray list and then this hit. So then it's right back in and you go out, you come back in. So Panama was really upset about that. But, you know, again, this was a corporation within their, you know, within their uh, borders that just happened to be doing some illegal, suspicious activity. I'm sure this is happening all over the U.S., right, in, in smaller instances. But, you know, it's harder to, to capture it without these data leaks. Uh, now, most of these folks were not convicted. As, as I mentioned, shell companies are perfectly legal uh, in the United States and in other countries. Uh, so hopefully with some of these new uh, the Corporate Transparency Act, Hopefully we can move the, you know, move the needle a little 
little bit more on this and start to get, gather more of that information to really get rid of those. I mean, at the end of the day, a shell corporation is not illegal, right? It's what are you doing within that shell corporation? Now, that's Panama Papers. The Paradise Papers, give me one second, I'm gonna grab a drink. All right, the Paradise Papers, uh, the UK actually struggled with this because remember, Queen Elizabeth II was listed in these leaks. Now, Queen Elizabeth has said, oh yeah, all the taxes were paid. <laughs> I mean, did she show us proof? No, she just, you know, we have to take her out of word. She's the queen, right? But, you know, a lot of the times, whenever the people that are mentioned in here are the rich, powerful, politically connected, they're the ones that own the media. And so a lot of times you're not going to see a strong media response if the folks that get mentioned are the ones that own the media. So there's a lot of speculation in the UK that this is what happened, that, you know, hey, these leaks were containing Queen Elizabeth, these leaks were containing some powerful people. Let's maybe not report on that because that was really detrimental to, to their business. So this is a struggle. And, you know, we see it in the U.S. Jeff Bezos owned the Washington Post. Uh, you know, Rupert Murdoch owns Fox. There's a lot of uh, corporate ownership done by rich and powerful folks. And anytime you see a news report that, that is saying one thing and you believe another, question it. Question it. And do your research. Dig in more to that to that thing you're looking at because sometimes one one news outlet might say one thing, one time a news outlet might say another thing. And it's really who owns that news outlet? Was that person mentioned in this? That can all lead to, you know, not getting the full truth. Now, Pan Panama, Paradise, Pandora. The fallout from the Pandora Papers really is still ongoing. October of 2021, the leak had a greater emphasis on the United States. Uh, so there was an example in there. Sioux Falls, South Dakota is a financial hub. Um, you know, South Dakota is a beautiful state, but Sioux Falls is right there. It's got all of these financial uh, companies listed there. Uh, there are trust companies that will help you build and create trust. And so what happened was they found uh, 30 trusts that were created right there in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that were connected to people um, accused of you know, public corruption, human rights abuses, criminal wrongdoing. So this is showing how criminals or you know folks that just don't want the government to know anything might go out and create a trust and, and kind of do an end run around some of our KYC, CBD, and EBD controls. But we're going to talk about trusts, you know, because this is probably the flashpoint on all of this. And, and you know, how do we deal with trusts? Because what's going to happen with the Corporate Transparency Act is there's going to be some different things happening with reporting and beneficial ownership. So hold tight for that. Um, so what I really want to drive home here is that, you know, the Pandora Papers, all these different leaks, they really help show how the rich and powerful are, are, are skirting around these rules, skirting around these laws to, you know, move money to another place to pay less taxes, uh, registering their business in one country, but operating in another. Uh, you know, that's pretty common too. Like I said, Apple was one of the big ones originally registered in, in Ireland, but operating in the United States. So it's 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 tough because every country's law is different and every country is going to treat this differently. Uh, but, you know, critical to understanding what's going on in your neck of the woods. You know, everybody here in the U.S. might treat this a little differently. So what has been the overall fallout from all of these leaks? Uh, you know, like I said, it exposes the way that the politically connected, the wealthy are hiding their money, moving their money around. You remember the FIFA scandal? FIFA is the International Soccer, uh, sorry, Football Federation. Uh, they're the ones that help you know, set up all these matches, the World Cup, all of these things. Uh, they were actually had a big scandal um, several years ago, and this Panama Papers leak led into the FIFA scandal. So there was some connection there. Now, look at the funds recovered down there at the bottom. 1.2 billion, 1.36 billion, about two and a half billion. Do you remember what the original numbers were? Anywhere from 5 trillion to 30 trillion. Do you know what the difference is between 1 billion and 1 trillion? It's about a trillion dollars, <laughs> okay? So that's a huge astronomical amount of money with a very small amount that's been repatriated. This isn't just US, this is international. It's really showing us how crucial and critical understanding our customers and knowing our customers really is. It's, you know, these are laws that are rules that sometimes add more burden to us at, at the financial institution, but at the same time strengthens that, that overall um, regime within the United States, the AML regime within the United States. We've been International companies have been way up. The United States has been about halfway. We really haven't had a lot of the same things. There's other countries that have beneficial ownership registries and that have been for years. We are really lagging behind a lot of international countries. Uh, you know, for ongoing due diligence, you know, are you monitoring for activity to and from areas of concern, or countries of concern, tax havens? You know, can we explain that activity? Does it make sense? Uh, they're going to find ways to, to, to go around this and to, to skirt around these rules. But that shouldn't stop you. We should still be capturing as much information as we can. Uh, you know, there's many tax havens. The United States is one. 
Uh, but hopefully with some of these new rules, we can kind of cut down on some of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we talk about those rules, you know, you'll see some differences in the Corporate Transparency Act that I hope will will kind of give you a little bit of a head start and hope, hope you feel good about some of these things. So let's go ahead and talk about, we talked about the Panama Papers and really the big thing I want to drive home is customer due diligence, KYC, it's all critical. So with CDD and the beneficial ownership rule, all we're trying to do is improve financial transparency. We want to have, you know, the, the, the people who own these businesses, the people who control these businesses, we want to have that on file. And it's important to be able to point back to that, especially if something illegal or unusual is going on. Who's conducting that activity? Are they here in the United States? Are they overseas? Uh, it requires you know to you to gather that information, and, and I think it's critical to, to understanding a, a complete picture of the business. I know for a long time we weren't doing it, and you know until we started doing it, you know I know a lot of folks had some headaches getting it you know implemented or implemented, implemented and uh, you know captured. Uh, but I know that it's a challenge, but I think that it, it, it significantly improves how we're doing things and, and we're, what we're actually doing with with AIM now and BSA. So. Uh, Kristen had mentioned the customer due diligence. I've given you the link, the link here. You want to screenshot that real quick. Um, I'll leave that up there for just a second, but that's our uh, customer due diligence checklist. Uh, so it really helps you build out those, those procedures, those policies. If you don't have this, or if you're, if you're thinking about revamping it, please visit the, the checklist. You know, give us a, shoot us an email, give us a call. Um, if you're a customer, we have client success managers that can help you. Uh, if you're not, we have contact information on our website. We're happy to help. You know, I, I work in advisory services, so I get a lot of like, hey, can you just take a look at this procedure? Does this make sense? This policy, does this make sense? And it's critical. It's critical making sure that we have all of those loopholes closed and making sure that we have a policy and procedure that makes sense. So if you need the help, I encourage you to download that checklist. Now, the, the, the beneficial ownership rule, identify and verify the identity of customers, identify and ver verify the identity of beneficial owners, understand the nature and purpose of the customer relationship and conduct ongoing monitoring. You know, this is this is all, you know, I'm sure I'm just speaking, I'm preaching to the choir here. This is something you already understand. Uh, just wanted to put it up there again and, and realize that, hey, yeah, we do need to capture this information. Name, date of birth, address, and social security number, the Fab Four. Uh, name, full name, not TJ, not DJ, unless that's their legal name. Um, and then the full address. We need a, an actual mailing, a uh, street address, not just a, a mailing address. They can put the PO box on file, but we need to have the actual address there. Okay, so that leads me in to my first poll question. And I'll read off the question while you ask, answer. What is a beneficial owner? Someone who owns at least 25% of the business? B, someone who manages the IT department for the business? C, someone who has control of the business? D, A and C, or E, all of the above? This is very much like a SAT question where they give you like six choices. And it's one of the above, all of the above, two of the above. <laughs> it's so difficult. All right, Kristen, do we have any results? Let's see. Let's see, yeah. So it looks like we had 70% answered um, D, so choices A and C. All right. Um, and then... All right, you all get a gold star. All right, A and C is the answer. Somebody who owns at least 25% of the business or somebody who has control of the business. Now, we'll talk about what control means, and let's talk about ownership because that could be directly or indirectly, and we're going to show you some examples of what directly versus indirectly looks like. And with the Corporate Transparency Act, you know, the control aspect of this has never been real clear. It's sort of a muddy definition. Uh, but the CTA has actually provided definitions of what a, a controller of the business looks like. So we'll talk about those examples in a little bit. Uh, you know, you can always go lower than 25%. I have some institutions that said, hey, we're going to go down to 10%. That's a decision for the institution to make. You are not required to go below it. You are simply required to gather 25% or more. It could be that, you know, you go down to 10%, you might be capturing 10 to 15 beneficial owners sometimes. So just think about where you're going to set that percentage. Make sure it's documented in policies and procedures. Make sure that it's very clear. So you have two prongs, the ownership prong and the control prong. And again, we're going to talk about what those look like here in just a second. We've got some examples here. So we're going to start with a very simple example. We've got Batman Incorporated. Now, I don't know why Bruce Wayne would go out and register Batman Incorporated. He's got a ton of money. You think he'd be smarter than that, but hey, just because you got a lot of money doesn't mean you're smart. So entity is Batman Incorporated. Bruce Wayne is walking into the to the branch to open an account. He's the only owner. He's the only controller. He's the sole, he's like the sole proprietor almost. Bruce is the only one we would capture that information on. Now, like I said, maybe Bruce needs to go create a trust so he can hide some of this. 
Uh, here's another example. So we have a Super Mario LLC. So we've got a, the customer here, Super Mario. Then we've got two owners, Mario and Luigi. But Mar Luigi doesn't own but 10%. Mario owns 90%, but Mario's sitting over on the, in the back with his feet kicked up, and Luigi's the one that's actually controlling the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So because Luigi is the controller, we would capture that information on Luigi. Because Mario is a 90% owner, that's 25% or more, we would capture that information on Mario. So the Mario brothers, I guess Mario's name is Mario Mario and Luigi Mario, we would be able to, to gather information on both of them, okay? Now here's where it can get a little complicated. Here's a, here's a complicated example, okay? So we have Stranger Things Incorporated. So Stranger Things Incorporated is owned by two entities, the Upside Down and Hawkins, okay? Each one of these entities have 50% ownership of Stranger Things. Now let's go down and look at the owners and the controllers of these businesses. Now, Will and Eleven co-own Upside Down. They are, Will is 60% owner with control and Eleven is 40% owner without control. So whenever we look at this because will has 60 percent and 11 has 40 percent of uh, the upside down but the upside down only owns 50 percent of stranger things so we need to technically take will and 11's percentages and divide them in half because they only own half of stranger things so will is technically a 30 percent owner with control of the upside down 11 is a 20 percent controller uh, owner uh, without control of upside down which controls 50 percent of the entity so technically will is 30 percent and 11 is 20 percent Okay. Now on the other side, Hawkins, 50% owner. 11 has 33% ownership of Hawkins. Hopper has 33% ownership of Hawkins. And Joyce has 33% ownership of Hawkins. And 11, if we just, let's just take 11 as the example. 11 has technically 16% ownership of Stranger Things through Hawkins. And she technically has 20% of ownership through ups, of Stranger Things through the 50% ownership of Upside Down. So technically 20%, 16%, Neither one of them are high enough, but added together, because we have to add them together because we're talking about the overall entity, 11 would be the one that we would capture information on. So we capture information on Will, we capture information on 11, and Hopper and Joyce, this is where it can kind of get confusing in terms of the controller. Because as you can see, Hopper is a 33% owner with control of Hawkins, and Will is a 60% owner of, with control of the upside down. Now we need to understand who's actually controlling Stranger Things. If it's Will or if it's Hopper, if it's both of them, we capture that information on both of them. Now, I, I, you know, you can look at the below percentages sometimes, and I've had banks say we're just going to do the percentages at the bottom. It gets complicated the further that you know, the further down in that corporate structure that they have, they may have several layers of this corporate structure. But then we need to ask ourselves, why do you have such a complicated corporate structure? There really shouldn't be any reason for having you know ten different businesses owning one business, which you know owns another business and owns another business. There really shouldn't be. Uh, you know, I don't know why they want to do that unless there's purposefully trying to hide something. So it's it's complicated, and and that's why it's critical that frontline staff understands this. They wouldn't they, if they just look at the percentages at the bottom. They're going to capture all of them, but if they actually look at what their percentage is owned through the entities that they work for or that they own, then they're going to see okay, the ownership's a little bit different. So it can get complicated really really quickly. I understand that. Um, but that's why it's critical that the frontline understands this is how you break this down. This is how you find out who's the percent owner, who's the controller. And like I said, I, we can't tell right now who's actually controlling Stranger Things because each one of those has 50 percent ownership and with people controlling those entities. So if they have percent uh, control over Stranger Things, maybe they split it 50 50 could be that way. Maybe one of them takes the, the lead on that. Uh, but that's why it's hard to sometimes find that, that controller whenever they have this laid out like this. The controller can't be Hawkins or upside down. It has to be an actual person. So when we talk about beneficial owners, we need to talk about getting to a heartbeat. Okay, we want to try to get down to a heartbeat if we can. But there are caveats to this. So here's a caveat. We have Chamber of Secrets Incorporated. It is owned by a revocable trust. So with beneficial ownership rules for banks and financial institutions, uh, you know, there is no requirement to, to gather information on the trusts. And we're going to talk about some differences with the CTA uh, and the beneficial ownership reporting there because it's going to look a little bit different. Okay, so we wouldn't gather this on Harry. We would gather it on the trust. Now, this is where, you know, it gets confusing. I have some institutions that say, well, no, we're going to go all the way to the trustee. And I don't see any problem with that. It's just that it's not required. Trusts are built out as an exemption. So, uh, you know, it, it gets tricky. Like I said, whenever I say, oh, let's get down to a heartbeat, there are caveats to that. Okay, so it's critical that we understand the rule and, and how it works, what are the caveats, okay? Some folks just say, no caveats, I don't care. We're capturing it on everybody. 
I think that's a decision, a risk-based decision for, for the institution to make. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I think it just adds too much of a burden to, to things. Uh, now, with all of this, we have to capture it on a form. It's a certification form. We need to be able to, to capture the identity of the person opening the account. If that's different from you know the, the, the beneficial owners, we need to capture all of the identifying information on the beneficial owners and then have the customer sign and date that. Now, if you have our due diligence manager product, you can generate this form right out of due diligence, have them sign it, upload it back in the due diligence manager, and it's all right there for you. So like I said, if that's an option for you, we can definitely help you out with that. Um, this also, due diligence manager would also help with gathering the nature and purpose. So you're trying to understand how are you going to use your account? What type of business are you? Does your activity jive with what the line of business is? So it's critical to understanding that and to understanding expected activity. Expected activity is going to say, does this transaction, you said you were going to do 5,000, you're really doing 50,000. You know, and, and look, I think that, especially nowadays with the pandemic and the way that it's shifted everything, you can really get some unusual responses to expected activity. They might say, oh, you know, I'm expecting to do 5,000. They might be a brand new business. I'm expecting to do 5,000 because the pandemic hits. Maybe they do $50,000 or $100,000 a month. So it might be a question of, you know, hey, I see a huge increase, but does that make sense? If there's a way to explain it, then, you know, no big deal. I mean, I perfectly, I, I get it. I get why somebody would come in and go, you know, I really don't know what I'm going to do. But for some, you know, established businesses, they're going to know. And if there's a huge drastic difference, can they explain it? Yes or no? Then we need to consider, you know, maybe filing that SAR. Okay. Now, with collecting of the info, this is kind of what it would look like in a nutshell beginning to end. Katie comes in and she wants to open up a business checking account for her um, uh, flower shop business. So what we do is we start with uh, gathering the identifying information from the customer. We want to know all about her business. Uh, we want to know who owns the business, who has control of the business. Is you know Katie going to be a signer? Is she the owner? Is she the controller? What is Katie? Um, we also need to figure out what is this flower shop? Like, are they just a local flower shop? Do they work with 1-800-Flowers.com? Do they work with you know other flower websites? Uh, really understand what their business is going to be. If, if somebody walks in and says, hey, I want to open a flower shop, uh, I want to open an account for my flower shop, we're also going to sell money orders. <laughs> Whoa, hey, hey no, hold on here. What are, what are you talking about? So it, it's critical to understanding the business, understanding what they're going to be doing with the business, um, and then ex the expected activity. And like I said, they, that's not always perfect, but it's something that if we capture it, we can still use that as the baseline. I'd rather have something there than nothing, okay? That, that at least gives us that baseline. Now, when we talk, we just talked about CDD, beneficial ownership, EDD, ongoing due diligence, your high-risk customers, they need greater scrutiny, sometimes moderate risk too. Um, you know, it depends. Sometimes your examiner or auditor might say, hey, maybe you look at this a little bit harder or look at this and start adding this to EDD. Um, I think that it's critical to, you know, having that documented in policies and procedures, looking at accounts, whether that that's at account opening, maybe right at account opening, 30 days, 90 days after account opening, come back and doing these spot checks. And then with your ongoing monitoring, you know, make sure that they're being passed through uh, the, the, the monitoring. Maybe that's uh, scenarios, maybe that's reports, whatever the case may be. Um, as long as we're monitoring them through our scenarios, through our reports, then we're also doing our ongoing due diligence every 90 days, every 180 days, every 365 days. Staying on top of that, uh, you know, there should be no problems. And, and for, the most, for the most part out there, folks are, are great about this. I think the harder part is sometimes trying to identify who is high risk versus who is not. Simply by the line of business, it can get tricky. You know, if we say, oh, you know, all lawyers, all doctors, all, you know, all car salesmen, they're all, you know, high risk. Maybe it takes a little bit more nuance than that. And, and that's where your overrides and that's where your control of being able to say this is high or this is moderate or this is low. That's where that comes into play. Now, let's transition a little bit to talking about uh, the Corporate Transparency Act, uh, also known as the AML Act of, of 2020. Uh, the beneficial owners. So this is starting to shift some things here. And I think this is this is really exciting for our industry because what's going to happen here is that the AML Act is it's increasing, you know, penalties, it's increasing the measures that we use to to you know validate these beneficial owners to make sure that we have some sort of registry that we can review and, and document and go back through and investigate. Uh, and then it's also increasing whistleblower uh, incentives. So I'm hoping that that strengthens up whistleblower protections a little bit. Um, but you know, this AML Act, the corporate trans Corporate Transparency Act, goodness, uh, has a, has some neat provisions in it. So, FinCEN put out an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking back early in 2020, saying that um, you know what we want to do is is implement a beneficial ownership registration, uh, a registry, uh, a database, and so we want the we want customers to be able to send this into us. Now, 
what they've done recently is, is, is put out a notice of proposed rulemaking very recently, uh, late, uh, early December. Uh, the, the rule is open or the proposed rule is open for, for public comment until February 7th. Uh, they are trying to implement the CTA's beneficial ownership registry reporting provisions. And so we'll, we'll talk about what this proposed rulemaking looks like and what, what might happen downstream from here. So the, the proposed rulemaking uh, uh, entry it, it, it describes who must file a beneficial ownership information report. So all of this going forward, if this passes and this gets in there, what's gonna happen is that when a, when a business registers with the Secretary of State, maybe they're registering as an LLC or an incorporated business, they're going to be required to send their beneficial ownership information to FinCEN, not you at the institution. The, corp the corporation, the LLC, they're gonna be required to send that information to FinCEN. Now it's very similar to the entities that you're having to capture that information on already. Uh, they built out the, the, except the exceptions. Uh, trusts are now included, business trusts, trusts registered with the state. Those are included now as, as who has to send that beneficial ownership information. So it's kind of cracking down on some of the trusts that, you know, but if it's not registered with the state, they're not required to, to report it. So it gets a little bit tricky here, but again, it, because of this, if the rule goes into effect and you all of a sudden start to see, you know, we're opening 10 estate accounts a day or 10 trust accounts a day, what's going on with that? You know, why are they doing that? Are they trying to hide something? You know, there, there's, there's an easy way to spot that. So you see a lot of trust accounts coming in. What's going on with that? Now, it also proposes what, what information has to be reported. It's the same thing you're reporting, the beneficial ownership of the controller or the, tw or the owner 25% or more. Now, like I said, they put a little bit of a harder definition on controller. OK, that's generally somebody that's going to have, you know, day to day control of the business. Are they making business decisions? Are they you know, a senior president or a, a CEO? They've got a lot more definition into what is the controller. So, again, I encourage you to go out, go to Finson's website, you know, hit the newsroom link. You'll see the advanced or the notice of proposed rulemaking. I, I, you know, I think that you're going to like what you see there. I think that it's exciting because now it's putting the onus on the on the corporation, on the business to report this as opposed to kind of using the banks as a, as a proxy to capture this information. So there's also some due dates tied into this. Now, whenever a new, cor a new corporation gets created after this regulation goes into effect, they'll have 14 days to provide that information to FinCEN. Now, before the, the rule goes into effect, if you've had a business before the rule goes into effect, then you have a year to get that document to, to FinCEN. Uh, if you're updating a document, maybe you changed owners or changed controllers, uh, you would need to send that in within 30 days. And then if you're correcting an erroneous report, you would have 14 days. So this is setting up some pretty tight timelines for, for folks to do this. And, and I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't even think FinCEN knows what this is going to look like. But the neat thing about all of this is the CTA not only requires them to create this beneficial ownership database, they're going to also have to figure out who can access it, who will be able to use it. And then they're also going to have to come back and revisit the beneficial ownership rule for financial institutions. So there may be some changes to that customer due diligence rule. So I would just encourage you to stay tuned. I think this is an exciting development. I think it's going to take time, obviously, but I think it's neat. We'll have a database. We can start, you know, double checking this information. And pretty soon they might take away the burden of capturing the beneficial ownership information. I don't want to, don't, 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 don't quote me on that. Don't take it to the bank or anything, but at the same time, you know, I think it's exciting. I think this is something that we can really start to really get to the bottom of some of these things where you have these really advanced corporate structures and who's those beneficial owners and being able to have a database, much like LexisNexis, you know, where you can log in and see history on all these customers. I think it's gonna be great if we can log in and say, oh, this corporate, you know, this corporation that we have at the, at the bank, maybe, maybe they never had to file beneficial ownership information. Maybe it was a grandfathered account. They never had any triggering events is to say, oh, I opened a new account or I changed signers on the account to require you to grab that beneficial ownership information. Now it might be something as simple as saying, well, hey, let's go check the database. So I think that there's some benefits to this. Uh, I definitely think it's going to um, help. And I think that it's going to be, uh, you know, kind of tricky to, to implement this. I don't know how they're gonna, will they penalize corporations or companies for not sending this information in? Really don't know, really don't know what this will look like. So. All I can say is stay tuned on that. Um, I think that it's exciting, like I said, and I think that it's uh, gonna be, provide a lot of benefits to us. All right, we've got one more poll question. Dun, da, da, da. All right, are you relieved that the reporting of beneficial ownership information to FinCEN is required to be done by the company itself and not the financial institution? A, sorta, B, 
Yes, hallelujah. C, no, I'd like more work, please. D, what is a beneficial owner? If any of you answer D, <laughs> we're gonna have to take this discussion offline. <laughs> All right, Kristen, what are our results? Let's take a look. Oh, a lot of people very happy about this. <laughs> hallelujah. It's like when Chevy Chase plugs the lights in at the at, at National Lampoon's Christmas vacation. You hear hallelujah <laughs> singing in the background. The angels are singing, shining lights down. I think it's going to be great. And I think that, like I said, there's going to be some changes to the CDD rules. So there might be some, some lessening of the burden off of the institution. So I just will encourage you to stay tuned on that. So just to cover some takeaways here, you know, getting that good beneficial ownership information is critical. And, you know, once we're able to start checking the database for this information, I think it's going to lead to a lot of, you know, you might see some different investigations coming out of this. Somebody who was not high risk at the time, now you check their beneficial ownership information, now, now they might be high risk. So I think that there's going to be a lot of benefits to this. Um, you know, again, the beneficial owners, equity, control. Control is defined better in the CTA than it ever was in the CDD rule. So I encourage you to, to review that if you're interested in that. Um, you know, understanding nature of business, expected activity is great as a baseline so that you can use that downstream for your CDD EDD reviews. Um, you know, your EDD reviews are necessary. We need to make sure we have the right high risk accounts that weren't or, or customers that we're not, you know, having too many of these, that we're not having too few of these as well. It's, it's a it's a tight rope balancing act. Um, you know, and we can help advisory services with a Brigo, we can definitely help. Um, you know, FinCEN is going to change up the beneficial ownership requirements because of this new beneficial ownership registry. Now, I would just encourage you to stay tuned. They may decide that, now nah, let's just keep the CBD rule for the banks, but it's technically been uh, included in the CTA that they have to come back and review and potentially revise that rule. So all I'm going to do uh, is tell you to stay tuned. Okay. All right. Kirsten, do we have any questions? Yes, awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Um, before we dive into our Q&A section, um, I do have one final poll question for the group um, that should be popping up on everyone's screens right now. Uh, this is just a good opportunity for you to let us know here at Abrigo. If you'd like assistance with anything related to your AML program, um, like Kevin said, we, had, uh, we have an awesome advisory services team that's here to help with a variety um, of your needs, um, you know, whether you need some help automating your CDD and EDD best practices, um, or any other staffing relief. Um, we have a variety of areas where we can help and we're more than happy to help anywhere we can. Um, while I have this up, I'll just remind everyone, um, if you have any questions, you can submit them in the Q&A portion um, of GoToWebinar right now, um, and we'll start diving into those in just a few seconds. Um, I'll give everyone yeah. just a couple seconds more to answer, and then we'll dive into Q&A. Yeah, Kristen Chris, only said that advisory services is awesome because I work there. <laughs> that is no, true. No, 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 no. No, the whole team is amazing. <laughs> I'm not that conceited. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Let's dive into some Q and A. Um, so we had uh, a couple of questions, kind of asking uh, specifically to go back to the uh, trust and trustee section. Um, a couple individuals that said, "I thought uh, the trustee of the trust would be the beneficial owner and control person." Um, can you clarify that a little bit, Kevin? Yeah, um, so trust, you are not required. And if a trust owns a business, I, I, look, I'm not going to stop you. For, I mean, I think that it makes perfect sense to go out and grab the trustees. I would do that but personally if I, were, if I were running a bank or running a BSA team. But, you know, it's not required. Trusts are not required to report that information. Um, you know, it's one of those situations where, depending on how, low, how deep you go, um, you know, I think that it makes sense to get to grab the trustee. I don't think the trustees are going to have any problem with that. Um, but, you know, according to the rule, trusts are excluded from that. Now, trust owning a business, like I said, the CTA is going to change that definition. Um, so, you know, there might be some differences there between the CTA and the CDD rule, but those are all going to have to be clarified by FinCEN through the CDD, you know, revision or update or whatever they do to that rule. So, um, you know, I I'm not going to tell you to stop. I think go ahead and continue to capture that. But just keep in mind that it might change. They might change down the road that we even have to capture this information at all. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, another question we had come in. Um, so with reporting of beneficial ownership directly to FinCEN, uh, mm -hmm. do we have a clear understanding of how accurate this information is going to be oh, sure. um, and how the information is going to be accessible for a financial institution? Sure. Yeah, so the first, the first part, uh, how accurate is this information going to be? Um, how accurate is your information right now? I think that that's probably the, the best way to gauge that because you know, they could fill it out probably with, and that's what, that's the other thing. I don't know what the framework of this looks like. If they submit a, a, a report and it's wrong, 
how are they going to get to know that? Is, is FinCEN going to come back and say this? How would FinCEN even know? So this is something where I don't know what the penalties of this looks like. If they start submitting fake reports or erroneous reports, there was a caveat to say you got to fix a an erroneous report in 14 days. But again, I don't see that how that framework is going to look. Now, they're also going to, part of the CTA also says that they have to figure out who's going to access this, what this looks like, how they get into it, how they investigate. So I think, I don't mean to keep saying, well, I don't know, but stay tuned because FinCEN's going to be building all of this out. So I think that, you know, there, there, of course, there's a possibility of getting bad data, but I think overall, the majority of the data will be good, but that's just me being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, another question we had come in. Um, so if a PEP is a beneficial owner, how would the CBD rule apply in this context? Um, will he or she be required to report information on an ongoing basis? Well, then being a PEP, um, you know, it's tricky. Um, you know, obviously they need to have a little bit more scrutiny at account opening and ongoing through the relationship, but I don't see anything different about them being a PEP or being just a normal, you know, person. Um, you know, they're still the owner. They're still the controller. They still need to be reported as beneficial owners. I think that, you know, if you have, you know, our software, you can always tag that customer as a PEP, and then you could run reports on the PEP uh, after some time. So there's ways to, to kind of build out some monitoring for PEPs, uh, but I don't think you need to do anything differently. They're the controller. They're the owner. Capture that info. Awesome. Let me look through our other questions here. Let's see. How does beneficial ownership work for an excluded entity? Oh, like, okay, well, okay. So the, the, the CTA and the CDD rule both have exemptions as to who has to file this information. So in the, whenever, the, whenever the businesses are gonna be in charge of having to file these reports, if you're an exempted report or exempted customer, or sorry, exempted business, you're not gonna have to file those reports. Um, if somebody comes in um, you know, and they're exempt from the, the beneficial ownership reporting or beneficial ownership capturing at a bank or a financial institution, then uh, you, know, you, you don't have to capture it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's one of those situations where I would love to be able to capture it on everybody. And maybe you can just make that blanket statement that we're gonna capture it on everybody. It's up to you. I mean, Vincent's never gonna say, hey, don't do that. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to, to, to capture it if you, if you think that it's, if you've seen some fraud, some money laundering, some things like that coming out of these accounts, I think it makes perfect sense to capture that, even though Vincent doesn't require it. Just because they don't require it doesn't mean that they don't maybe, you know, it doesn't mean you can't do it, okay? So I think that, you know, you can follow the caveats, follow the exemptions. For frontline staff, it's really difficult sometimes to capture, uh, to, to figure out who, who am I gonna capture this on, how far down do I go? I think that they're critical. That's critical to, to have a good program. Absolutely. Great advice. Thank you, Kevin. Let's see here. Another um, great question. Um, so in response to the P papers, what are FIs doing when they come upon a positive match? Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the, P, the P papers. I love it. Okay. Um, so, you know, if it were me, you know, and I'm just going to, we'll just do the hypothetical. And if it were me, if I captured some information, you know, coming out, I was on the ICIJ's website. I saw a customer name that that clicked with me, and I rec and I recognized it. Um, you know, first things first, go look at, go review the accounts. You know, time to review the accounts. What risk rating do we have on these accounts? Are they low or moderate? Maybe they need to be high. Um, I would think that, like I said, just because they're mentioned, doesn't mean that they're doing something illegal. Okay, so I would still double check, review the accounts. Are they doing something suspicious out of the accounts? You could always file for negative news. So you could always file on them for negative news and say, hey, well, we found them on the Pandora paper leak. Um, but, you know, in terms of your accounts, if they're not doing anything suspicious, then I wouldn't report the accounts. I would just report the customer and say, hey, there's some negative news. Thank you, Kevin. Um, let's see, we've had a lot of awesome questions come in. Thank you, everyone, for submitting these. Um, another one that came in. Um, so for financial institutions that bank uh, VF. BFWs or American Legion type businesses where the officers change every year or so, would an FI be required to gather beneficial ownership um, or control their documents every year or every change? Okay, well, the, okay, so twofold question. Like, if you don't know when they're going to be doing these updates, we need to have some sort of triggering event at the bank or the credit union to say, hey, now we're going to capture it. So if they came in and opened a new account, if they came in and changed a signer on the account, um, you know, if they're, uh, you know, you can have a lot of different triggering events in terms of how you're going to capture this beneficial ownership information. Now, I have to say that if you know they're changing, you know, their, their leaders every year, 
I would set up a task to, to, to get that information every year because you know it's happening. You know it's going to change. Now, granted, they might not change every day or every year on the same day, but I think that it makes sense to go out and have some sort of event or have some sort of uh, task to go out and capture that information from the customer, maybe set up a rapport with that customer so that they can come in. And on the day that they do it, they'll just bring you the information. I think that making it clear to them that why you're capturing it and you know, making it clear that, hey, we need to capture this every time. Um, will we'll help in that. I, I you know, I, I hate to to say, you know, hey, you know that they're changing. You know, how often should you change it? It should change every time that they change, since you know that they're changing. Some of them you don't know. They they might change. You know, they might get sold to another person. They might have you know a different you know vice president or something come in. I think that's a lot more challenging. But when you know that they're going to change, then let's go out and reach out to that customer and get that new information from the customer. Fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, this is another one, um, diving into beneficial ownership. Um, if we have multiple beneficial owners, is it mandatory to mention all beneficial owners over 25% or only the one with controlling the maximum percentage? Is that sufficient? Yeah, no, 25% uh, or more ownership. So if somebody owns 25% and somebody else owns 70%, then we need to get we need to get it on the 25 and the 70. Um, controller, like I said, is a little bit more vague. It's hard to define what a controller is for some businesses. Um, I think the Corporate Transparency Act helps with this. Um, I think it gives a much stronger definition. So I would always encourage banks to read that, uh, credit unions, financial institutions, read through that, read through their definition of controller, see if that jives with yours, and then set that up. But it, you know, controlling, it, there is no percentage for controller. It's either they control it or they don't. They're either the CEO or they're not. So that's a, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of that. The 25%, like I said, some banks are going lower than that, but I would just, everybody who's 25% or more, even if they don't have control, they may have 90, like we showed that uh, example with Super Mario, they had 90% ownership, but he was not controlling the business. I'd still capture the beneficial owner information for him. Excellent, thank you. Let's see here. Here's another great question. Um, so this uh, individual said they only open nonprofit accounts or unincorporated associations. They do not open business accounts uh, for LLC, LLCs, partnerships, et cetera. Um, do they only collect on control prong in this case? So that it, it goes back to the way that it was formed. If it's if it's formed with the Secretary of State, you know, you know, with the state, I, I would be a little bit more hesitant to to ignore some of these things. Yes, I would at least co collect the control prong on them. Um, with some of the nonprofit associations, you see them owned by other, you know, there's there's not really one person who owns or even benefits from the company. So it's a lot harder to, to try. There's really no requirement to do that either. So I would focus on control. And, and you know, like I said, if there's anything that we can do that goes beyond what FinCEN wants, I, I would do it. And, and even if they didn't require that, I would still probably do it just because it, it says, you know, it, it, it shows us who's actually controlling the business. There could be completely different. Usually there's not equity ownership between a, a nonprofit. So that's why that's really not required, but I still would capture uh, the controller on that. Fantastic. I think we have time for one more. Um, this is just circling back to CTA. Um, they're curious, um, does this just apply in the United States? Is there anything similar on a global level that we might be um, able to look forward to? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I would say that in some countries are already well past what we're doing. Um, they're already going above and beyond what we do. And we're kind of coming up to a level where I think we could even take it a step further. Um, but, I, you know, no, this is just the United States thing, the Corporate Trans Transparency Act. Um, but I would encourage you to, you know, FATF, FATF's website is, is great. It'll tell you who's good, who's bad, who's, who's doing the good stuff, who's doing the bad stuff for, for the countries and their AML regimes. So I would encourage you to, to go out to their website. Um, but, you know, overall, no, just the United States will be involved with this one. Um, but, you know, it, it, there are foreign companies that operate in the United States. So these reporting companies, whenever the CTA comes into effect and that um, advance notice of proposed making, if they can come out and say, hey, look, you're a foreign entity, but you're operating in the United States, we can require that information now. So there are ways, I think, for us to kind of, you know, as long as they're operating in the U.S., there are ways for us to capture that information. I just don't know what that might look like, you know, what all of this will look like really. Got it, that makes sense. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I believe we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing with you, with us today. Um, great information all around. 
Um, if anyone has any questions or would like to get in touch with Abrigo or today's presenter, please don't hesitate to send us an email or connect with us on our website. Um, these slides, along with the continuing education certificate and other relevant resources, will be sent to you in a follow-up email later this afternoon for your convenience. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day, and we look forward to having you on future sessions. Thank you all so much. Thanks, y'all. Y'all have a great day.